I was going to talk about first trimester screening for preeclampsia, but I think in the context of this meeting, the most important aspect of this test is looking at the uterine artery Doppler. So what I'd really like to do is focus on measurement of uterine artery Doppler in the first trimester. If you look at the first trimester screening test for preeclampsia, this is in fact by far the most important marker. So if I make a comparison, when we do screening for um, aneuploidy, nuchal translucency, if you look at the way it affects risks, is the most um, important marker. And for, for preeclampsia, um, uterine artery Doppler is the same. So um, just to think about where we come from, so traditionally, if we're going to look at the uterine artery Doppler in the second trimester, we use a technique where we come away from the midline towards the side wall of, of the uterus, um, often moving the angle of the probe. So we're sort of opening the face of the probe to come along the pelvic side wall um, in the line of the inguinal canal so that we can see the external iliac vessel and um, we can then um, find the uterine artery. Um, and what's quite interesting is that for all the work that's been done on second trimester uterine artery Doppler, there's actually not a very well-defined protocol for how we should measure that. And for some of the research we're doing at the moment where we're trying to make comparative measures from the first and the second trimester, people turn around and say, well, how do you want us to do this in the second trimester? Because there's not really um, a, a particularly well-defined uh, process. So what we've designed to do is to um, find where the vessel crosses the external iliac and measure the positivity index about one to two centimeters above that. And um, you know, I think uh, with uh, many of the machines that we see these days, and this is the I-800, you can see that you're getting very nice um, uh, evidence of perfusion. It's very easy for you to find these vessels in both the second and third trimester. So we've known for a long time um, that uh, uterine artery Doppler is useful. So um, this was actually some work that Aris uh, Papagiorgio produced, um, which used this as a screening test at 23 weeks. The problem with this is that we don't really have an effective treatment at this stage. But just to reinforce the importance of this as a marker in screening for preeclampsia, these are traditional risk factors that we would use on the basis of maternal history. Um, and if we just make the comparison of using the uterine artery Doppler uh, compared to some of our uh, typical tools with maternal characteristics, you can see how valuable it is um, uh, in, in comparison. And we now have means of combining likelihood ratios from different markers. So we can take history, you could take biochemistry, and the uterine artery uh, all into account. So as I say, the problem with this test at 22 weeks is we don't have an effective intervention. So this was some work that Chrissy Yu did, um, again in the UK, in a large population, 20,000 women who were screened. And then high-risk women were randomized to either having aspirin or placebo. And, um, a couple of interesting things. First, there was no reduction in preeclampsia or IUGR with starting treatment at this late stage of pregnancy. Uh, the second thing is actually, although it's not significant and it wasn't a, an endpoint that had been set out as a primary endpoint, it, it looks as if there's a small increased rate of abruption in the aspirin group here. And that's actually consistent across the literature. If you start aspirin later in pregnancy, it seems to be associated with a small increased risk of abruption. Whereas if you start it very early in pregnancy, it seems to be associated with a reduced risk of abruption. So we know that aspirin uh, is a useful screening tool. Um, here's an example of using it screening for IEGR. And again, we know that we should be doing this after some screening process early in pregnancy to have maximal effect of the therapy. And this was um, the work of uh, Leona Poon, who's talking at the meeting, um, and also Neil O'Gorman, who's validated uh, many of the algorithms that Leona uh, produced using uterine artery Doppler, which you can see on the left, combined with other um, screening tools. So um, I am a disciple of first trimester screening, and the, uh, I'm a disciple of um, uh, Galileo Galilei, who said the language of God is mathematics, and um, measure what's measurable and make measurable what is not so. And this certainly applies to uterine artery uh, Doppler, so in the first trimester, we want to make sure that we standardize the technique. And it's very different to the technique that we use in the second trimester. And in fact, if you apply the second trimester approach, I'll try and demonstrate this in a few minutes, you'll find that you get very different values uh, of measurement. So we start from the midline uh, 
been able to locate the cervix. We're looking at the branch of the uterine artery that arises uh, over the cervix. And instead of opening the face of the probe and moving towards the pelvic sidewall, what we do here is really just rock the probe so that we come to the edge or the lateral boundary of the cervix where we can pick the uterine artery up. And why do we use this technique? Well, um, this is an old paper that basically showed that this approach was much better at being able to pick up the first trimester um, uterine artery waveform with a transabdominal scan. Um, and the type of uh, image that you get is very much like this. So here you can see this, this bladder is probably a little bit over full, but it helps for the demonstration. Um, you've got the vagina coming uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. Then you can see the bulk of the cervix. And then as you just um, sort of move the probe to the lateral sidewall, you can pick up the uterine artery uh, very quickly and very easily. And the type of waveform that we see is, is something like this. This is a slightly older video clip from the Fetal Medicine Foundation. Really, I just wanted to put this here to demonstrate that in the first trimester, almost universally, you will see a degree of notching. And we don't really talk about notching as a clinical sign. Um, we are very much more about measurement of the pulsatility index and then actually putting that in an algorithm that creates a multiple of the median value. So people often ask me, what's the normal range for a uterine artery doctor in the first trimester? And if you go to the literature, it's actually very difficult to tease that out. So for example, Kipros's group, uh, a guy called Walter Placencia, uh, produced a paper about what uterine artery measurements should be in the first trimester, but it's a customized measurement. So it relies on ethnicity, your parity, whether you smoke or not, what your BMI is. And uh, if you asked Walter what's a normal value, he'd say, well, you've got to tell me those four things uh, before I can tell you what the normal range should be for that patient. Um, certainly for our sonographers, they quite like to have some idea of what ballpark measurement should be. And we've produced this uh, first trimester range uh, that you can see here. So in terms of risk assessment, we're going to convert this to a MOM value. We're then looking at a normal population, say in blue, the abnormal population in red. So as we're developing likelihood ratios based on these measures, it's very important that we make sure that we have uh, an accurate measurement in the first place. And um, we now have uh, likelihood ratios that you can see um, over here for different types of preeclampsia, so early preeclampsia, late preeclampsia, and also for IUGR. And, and this is the paper of Walter Placencia showing the different um, maternal characteristics that will affect um, uh, uterine artery Doppler measurement. In our own um, study, um, we found that if we just take a maternal history to predict preeclampsia and compare that then to using uterine artery Doppler, if I take 34 weeks as a cutoff, then adding uterine artery Doppler increases the detection rate of our screening process by about 30-35%. Uh, now, I think it's worth just mentioning this new technique that's been uh, recommended or suggested this year. This has come out of uh, Calgary group um, with Joan Johnson's group. Uh, and this is a concept of instead of using a sagittal section, turning the probe so that you're going to pick up both uterine arteries uh, at the uh, level of the internal cervical os. Um, and um, you can see them both uh, here laterally. And um, Joanne's group's done some work that has validated um, the measures that you get in comparison to the traditional uh, sagittal technique, and they seem to be uh, identical. And many people find this technique a little bit simpler. So you can see both of the uterine artery uh, Dopplers uh, here. So um, this is just the evidence that the validation shows that they're um, concordant uh, with the sagittal process. Um, we also are beginning to explore uh, using a transvaginal approach in the first trimester. You get lovely views of the cervix, and you can see, again, just as you turn the probe, you can pick up the uterine artery uh, laterally very uh, simply. That's just an example of a waveform uh, from the first trimester. So some pitfalls. Um, probably the main pitfall is making sure that you measure the uterine artery PI down at the level of the internal cervical os. So this is just an example on the left of what happens if you um, go a little bit further upstream. And you can see that effectively the pulsatility index um, is reduced by 15%. And that will also have a significant impact 
on the sensitivity of your overall screening test. So this is just a demonstration of that. This is, uh, again, some work of Leona's uh, from Hong Kong. And she's basically looked at what would happen to your detection rate on the y-axis of this graph for shifts in the PI. And if you get a 15% reduction in the PI, then you can see you get about a 10% reduction um, in the sensitivity of the test. There is a quality assurance process for um, uterine artery Doppler. Um, we've developed one in-house, I'll show you in a moment, but there's also one from the Fetal Medicine Foundation. And um, this will give you a report, if you put your data in, of where your measurements lie in relation to a normal range. The methodology that we use is uh, using the technique, again, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where it will describe your normal range and also uses this precision plot to show how your measurements are compared to standardized measurements. And it also produces this thing called a custom plot. So um, this is sequential measurements made by a single operator. And if you have someone who always overmeasures or always undermeasures, then you'll begin to see that you move away from the baseline. And so this is actually a very good uh, visual uh, tool to give our sonographers to help make sure that we're making appropriate measurements. Um, this is just another uh, sonographer that perhaps isn't performing as well, and you can see the measurements there moving away from baseline so that you know that you've got to um, come back to that and focus on technique uh, to see if you can make some improvement. So that's all I wanted to, to say, uh, and I think we're going to do a little scan and try and demonstrate some of those features. Thanks, Rob. we go to live scanning. Yes. Okay, so um, the question so people can hear at the back, um, do we perceive any changes in uterine artery Doppler if women are already on aspirin? The answer is um, at 12 weeks we don't have that data. What we do have is some data where we've looked at high-risk women who were taking aspirin and who were not um, taking aspirin at 12 weeks and 20 weeks. For all women, we see a reduction in PI with advancing gestation. Um, certainly in the cohort of women who are taking aspirin, who went on to have preeclampsia, and for us, that's actually a tiny number, so the statistics are difficult. Um, but we do see that their PA, PI stays higher than other women where the PI seems to normalise from the high-risk group towards the low-risk group. Yeah. Who are already high risk according to uh, biomarkers and history. Yeah. Would you start aspirin earlier than the time or first time it was produced? Yeah, okay. So the question is um, if I knew someone was high risk on the basis of maternal history, would I start aspirin at an earlier stage? I guess the addendum to the question is if I then screen them in the first trimester and it's normal, would I be brave enough to stop aspirin at that stage? Um, so I, I think. We have to put it in the context that aspirin seems to be a very safe drug to use in pregnancy in, in low dose. Um, we don't have any data at the moment that shows us that starting women on aspirin at seven weeks is better than starting women on aspirin at 12 weeks in terms of reducing the prevalence of preeclampsia. Although I think you could make a biological argument that if aspirin is affecting trophoblast function, that it would be better to start it earlier rather than later. Um, in our population, if you use the ACOG guideline, we actually have a relatively low proportion of women who would be defined as being in the high-risk group. It's about 2%. So the comparator to the 12-week system that we're using is we produce a high-risk group of 10%. So we are putting many more women on aspirin by the time of the 12-week scan. We certainly do see women who are already being put on aspirin uh, when we screen them. We think screening is valuable anyway because it helps us define the pathway of surveillance through the remainder of their pregnancy. Um, certainly, if they're on aspirin and we screen them and we still find they're very high risk, um, we sometimes are now thinking about what other measures we could take to try to negate risk through their pregnancy. Um, we have not yet been brave enough to stop aspirin if they have a low risk uh, result at 12 weeks. I think that would be a very interesting study. Perfect. All right, we might go to the scanning in order Great. of time. Are you comfy? Great. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit cold again, yeah? 
sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, let's hope it's not on the microphone. There you go. <laughs> okay, I might just stay on the low frequency probe to start with. So, you happy with that? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, we're going to do a first trimester scan here. Um, we're approximately 14 weeks gestation, and it's always um, interesting when you look at. Uh, have you? Okay, it's interesting when you look at a fetus at uh, 14 weeks gestation. They always have this sort of bolt up like little appearance in the uterus. So you have to sort of just manipulate the probe a little bit and just roll the probe round to to get the fetus to to lie down. Um, so just before. Um, we go any further, let's just sort of get our eye in. Um, so what I might just do is just uh, demonstrate. Uh, so we've got a crown rump length that is about 82 millimeters. So the end of 13 weeks gestation. It's just trying to see if I could get a slightly better view of the baby's face. Let's just give them a bit of encouragement. <laughs> yeah, I'm at a slightly awkward angle to, to see the nuchal translucency properly. Um, if I just come into a slightly different plane, so you can just see um, the BPD there, you can see um, the choroids, you can see the faults quite nicely. Just as I come down here, you can see the face quite nicely. You can actually see the mouth, and um, you can make out in this plane, although it wouldn't be the plane you would use for screening, the two nasal bones. You can also see um, the, the lip there. And just as I s just scan through quite briefly, um, you can obviously see the chest here. You can see the four-chamber view. And we've got the two arms and hands out front working our way through. We've got the two legs down the bottom end there. Just coming back for a moment, you can see the stomach um, below the level of the heart, so that's nice. And you can see um, the abdominal wall looks intact as well. So I might just... Um, we couldn't do this before, but let's just see perhaps if we can look at the heart in a little bit more detail. Uh, yeah, why don't we try that? Yeah, let's go for that. Yeah. So I'm a bit of an opportunist um, when I'm sc scanning in the first trimester, and um, you know, if you've got the fetus in a nice position to be able to, to look at various structures. Um, it's good to do that. Um, you can also see the baby's moving quite a lot. So often I find it's better just to sit in one place and, and let the, the fetus do the work. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, also you can see you know, the chambers, both ventricles fit in quite nicely. Occasionally, as the fetus rotates, you get that view of the left ventricular outflow tract and then the right ventricular outflow tract and the vessels coming um, up to the head and neck. So um, I think that that all looks quite nice. What we might do is just whiz off and do um, our uterine artery Doppler for a moment. So you okay? You still comfortable? Yeah. So the first thing that I've done is take a more panoramic um, view um, just to try to help make sure that I'm localizing anatomy properly. So you can see here that we've got the bladder on the right-hand side of the screen um, here, and you've got the, obviously the uterus coming around. This is the placenta at the top. I've got our little fetus um, here, and then you can um, sort of see where the vagina's coming through, and then this is the level of the cervix in this area here. Can I just pull down this down a little bit further? And so what I'm doing is I'm just um, trying to make sure that I can see the cervix relatively clearly. You can see that you get some dropout from the posterior aspect of the cervix um, there. Um, and if I just put the color on now, I'm in the midline at the moment. 
and I've, what I've done is I'm just tweaking across laterally. Are we on that second trimester setting that you used before? Yeah, yeah let's just do that. We're just going to change the setting for a moment. So this is one uterine artery that we can see here. Then if I move across the cervix, this is looking at the other one on this side. So I can just measure the pulsatility index here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Might just invert that and just pull the baseline down again. Lost it now. Oops. Yep. Hmm. So I'm just going to um, come into that transverse view. So I'm just pulling the probe down here. So this is the level of the uh, internal cervical os at this level here. Move a little bit laterally. And then I can pick up the vessel there. And typically, I'd actually have the, the um, sweep speed a little bit faster so you could get three, um, three measurements on, on the screen at the same point in time. Um, we can actually measure probably on an auto. Where's the auto? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's try that again. We'll do that manually instead. So can you just take me back to... Yeah, okay. It's always like this, isn't it? <laughs> I know. Let's take that off for a minute. Yeah. So in terms of um, screening, um, you can see I'm struggling a bit. We actually did this very nicely earlier on. I think I'll, I'd probably op empty the bladder and start again here. But um, I just wanted to show you, I'm a bit too far downstream here. So the speed is less than 60 centimeters per second. And really, therefore, I can't use this uh, for a screening uh, measure. So let's just see if we can persevere a bit and get a little bit uh, better. Just come back to the 2D. You're right, managing. Yeah. What I might do is actually change to the other probe and yeah.
So again, just trying to concentrate down on the uh, cervix here. Yeah, again, I'm not getting a great image here at the moment. So what we might do, have we got another we patient? Got another we might just switch out and have another little look. So, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> and thank you for your help. Shall I let you... Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Or um, we might make a. Yeah. Well, we should be okay. Let's just. Um... Use the bigger probe again. Okay, sorry, I just pulled a little bit lower there. So as we um, are getting this ready, any final questions for John from the audience? Yes, I'll come down. Yep, there we you go. can see your baby. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll come back and show you your baby in a little mm -hmm. bit more detail. Uh, sorry, the if there are any changes like fibroids in the uterus, the, 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 does the uh, change the P, P, PI or not? Um, so I think, I mean, if you had a really big cervical fibroid, then I think the answer is going to be yes. Um, so that's a much better example of where we're at with waveform. You can see much better velocity there. Um, we'll just perhaps measure that. We'll just do it on the auto trace. Just got to be a little bit careful with the sensitivity on the auto trace. I don't know if you can change the sensitivity at all. Yeah, okay. So just to make sure that you're actually measuring the complete waveform. Um, so and uh, here, just as a reference, you can see the PI is 1.68. I'd probably just play with that a little bit more in terms of sensitivity before using that. Um, so, so this was the uterine artery on this side. If I just sweep across the cervix, um, we can find the vessel on the other side here. So I think that's a much better demonstration of, of um, where we're at, um, typically in terms of ease. And if I just come around to that transverse view, so you can see the fetus here, as I come down the uterus towards the level of the cervix, if I just put the color box on now at this level, then you can see the two uterine artery dopplers probably just need to make the box a little bit wider um, either side of the um, cervix there. And again, I think the nice thing about this is you have the reference of knowing where the other vessel is at the same time. <coughs> We'd have to do a little bit of work just um, picking that up properly. And I'll just come across to the other side. Oh, 
All right, so I might just stop there for the sake of time, but um, I hope that once out of twice I managed to demonstrate <laughs> it was relatively straightforward. Uh, it's interesting, actually, that we got some nice pictures earlier. Um, the joys of live scanning. So thank That's you. That's right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Round of applause, John.